All right, so this is going to be the pre-lab lecture for the third experiment. Um, this week we're going to be looking at ionic compounds and kind of some of their base properties that they have. So one of the things we're going to be looking at a lot is how ionic compounds act in solutions. So one compound people have a lot of familiarity with is sodium chloride, also known as table salt. So when I put sodium chloride in solution, it breaks up, so this is just in H2O, breaks up into both its constituent ions. So remember an ionic compound is a compound between a metal and a non-metal, or a metal and a polyatomic. So when this is in water, what happens is it breaks up and we get a sodium ion, so Na plus, plus Cl minus. So it breaks up into these constituent ions. So this is going to be true for any ionic compound that is soluble in water. So this week for the experiment, you guys are going to be rotating between four different stations. I'll kind of quickly touch on what you're doing at each of them. They're all fairly easy this week. We're not writing too many chemical reactions. It's just going to be dissociations and stuff like that. The experiment next week is going to be a little more in-depth when it comes to writing reactions and stuff, so this is going to serve more as like an introduction to this. So in station one, you guys are going to be using these conductivity meters, and they look sort of like this. So you have a box here, a little 9-volt battery on top of it, and then you get these two electrodes that are going to stick out. So you guys are going to see on the conductivity meter, it's going to have a reading of either from 0 to 10. And basically, it's going to just measure the conductivity when you hit a button on it of the solution that you stick it into. So you guys are going to be looking at station 1. You guys are going to be comparing both tap water and DI water. So if you guys remember, in lab, we tend to use distilled water or DI water, which basically means we take out any of the ions that are present, so it's just pure water. So you have two beakers of it, and you guys are going to take the conductivity reading of each. Now, ideally, as long as these beakers stay free of contaminants, I'm going to give you guys a hint. The DI water should give you a reading of zero because water itself is a very poor conductor. The tap water, on the other hand, should give you some reading. There is some ions dissolved into it. The second part of this station, which is actually pretty cool, is you guys are going to be putting a couple drops of silver nitrate. So silver nitrate, also known as AgNO3. So you guys are going to be putting a couple drops of silver nitrate into the tap water solution and see what happens. What should happen, you guys should get a cloudy precipitate that forms. It's going to be light, but there should be something there. So, and the lab manual is going to ask you, well, what is it? What's happening? So, same thing as above here. So, silver nitrate is a soluble salt, so aqueous. So, if we put this into water, we're going to get Ag plus plus NO3 minus. Now, if you guys remember your solubility rules, all nitrates are soluble. So whatever is precipitating in that tap water solution, it's not going to be from the nitrate. It's going to be from this silver guy here. So basically what we're seeing is silver plus reacting with some unknown anion. And that's going to form some kind of silver compound that's solid. And obviously these are aqueous. So at station two, you guys are going to have four solutions in front of you. You're going to have methanol, which is CH3OH. You're going to have acetic acid, which is CH3COOH. You're going to have sodium chloride, NaCl. And you're going to have hydrochloric acid, or HCl. So you're going to be doing the same thing you're doing in station one. Um, you're going to be measuring the conductivity of each of these. 
So what you're going to learn here is the difference between a non-electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, and a strong electrolyte. So I didn't mention it above, but in order to conduct electricity in solution in water, you need ions present. And the more ions present, the better conductor of electricity that solution would be. So for stuff like sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid, these guys fully dissociate in solution. So like I showed above, when I throw sodium chloride into water, it breaks up into sodium plus and Cl minus. Um, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, so it does the same thing. This is going to break up into H plus plus Cl minus. Now acetic acid right here is a little different. Acetic acid is what we call a weak acid. So what actually happens in solution is acetic acid will partially break up into H plus and CH, C, CH3COO minus, also known as acetate. So now this reaction can also go in the other direction too, which is called an equilibrium. You guys are going to learn more about that eventually. But all you have to know is this doesn't 100% dissociate in solution. So what does that mean? That means we're going to have less ions present, which means that the conductivity should be lower in this. This should be what we call a weak electrolyte. Um, the other thing too to know is we have things that are called non-electrolytes. So I, I kept saying ionic compounds dissociate in solution. Ionic compounds can conduct electricity. Well, not just ionic compounds can be dissolved. So a example of a non-electrolyte would be simple sugar. So C6, H12, O6. So if I put sugar into water, it dissolves. But these are what we call molecular compounds. So these aren't composed of two ions coming together. So when I put this into solution, it just stays C6H12O6. So since there's no ions present, this doesn't conduct electricity in a solution. So that would be what we call a non-electrolyte. So again, the three kind of categories of things, we have strong electrolytes that fully dissociate, we have weak electrolytes that partially dissociate, and we have non-electrolytes that don't dissociate at all. Station three is low-key one of my favorite reactions you guys do all semester. Station three, you guys are going to be reacting magnesium metal or magnesium solid. And you guys are going to be reacting them with two different types of acids. So similar to what I said above, you can have two different types of acids. You have strong acids and weak acids. So strong acids 100% dissociate. Weak acids don't 100% dissociate. So what's cool, though, is when we react magnesium with acid, so it will react with the H plus from the acid, because remember, acids produce H plus. We're going to get magnesium in solution, and we're going to produce hydrogen gas. So when you guys do this in lab, you'll see it'll start bubbling away. The magnesium strip's going to actually look like it's disappearing. It's actually just being dissolved into the solution. And what's happening is you're producing that those bubbles are hydrogen gas being produced. Now, if you look, you're going to have two solutions there. You're going to have six molar hydrochloric and six molar acetic. So both these guys are the same concentration. The only difference is one of these is a strong acid, which means it will 100% dissociate. One of them is a weak acid, which means it won't 100% dissociate. So you guys are going to compare the rates of reaction, basically how vigorously and how quickly that magnesium dissolves based on what acid you have present. And you guys are going to basically infer what's going on here. The final station, station four, is kind of like a game of Clue. So you guys are going to have different solutions in front of you. You're going to see that some of them have color in them. Some of them are colorless. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to ask you guys 
what ion is giving the color. And we're going to give you enough information that you can figure it out. So, for example, you'll see one of the solutions there will be sodium chloride, NaCl, and it will be colorless. So, again, keep in mind all these all these solutions are with soluble salts, so they're all going to break up. So, we have Na plus plus Cl minus. And since the overall solution is colorless, we know that both of these ions are also colorless. Now, next to that, you'll see that there will also be a solution of nickel chloride, let's say. And you'll notice that nickel chloride is a greenish solution. Now, we already know, so if I break this up, this is going to be nickel 2 plus plus... 2 Cl minus. Now we already know from above that the sodium chloride is going to be colorless. So we know that the sodium ion is colorless and we know that the chloride ion is colorless. So we can infer that the chloride ion would stay colorless. So it's going to be colorless here, which means that green color we're seeing is coming from the nickel ion. And basically, you guys are going to work your way through this. So it's going to be kind of a game of clue. You're going to be looking at the colorless solutions and trying to see well if this is colorless and this one's colored which ion is giving me the color now guys very important it may sound minute but I keep using the term colorless not clear all these solutions are going to be clear and what we mean by clear is there's no precipitate in the solution so you can see through the solutions what we're trying to say here is there's no color so we are going to say colorless instead of clear other than that, that's basically it for this week. Like I said, this lab's kind of a soft introduction to ionic compounds. Next lab after this is going to be a little more in-depth with reactions and equations. So if you guys have trouble with that, you know, reach out to me. Reach out to your TAs now because it's better to get a hold of it before we get to that experiment than when we get there and feeling lost. Um, other than that, that's it. You guys can get your pre-labs done, and I'll see you this week for lab.